As we continue our sermon series on imitating Jesus, copy that, we look today at Jesus' habit of crossing boundaries. As followers of Jesus, we are called to learn and copy the ways of Jesus. But sadly, we are not always successful. It is easy to go to church and claim the name Christian. It is another thing altogether to actually live a Christian life day after day. So the question we're asking in this series, copy that, what does a distinctive Christian life look like? It's not just about being a nice person who gets along with people and is considered to be a good person. That's not it. Being a Christian is a very particular thing. It's a very particular way of living this life. It includes the things we've learned in the previous two weeks, showing mercy, living in intentional community. In the weeks ahead, we'll talk about some other aspects, like moving toward pain, picking up your cross, self-sacrifice, loving your enemies. But today we talk about crossing boundaries. Think about the boundaries that exist between people. There are naturally occurring boundaries, but there are also artificial boundaries that we raise between one another. I remember when I went to kindergarten, first day of kindergarten, I came home and my mom asked me, so did you make any new friends? And I said, yeah, a kid named Washington. And she said, well, tell me about him, tell me about him. I said, well, he's different than I am. His skin is a lot darker and his hair grows in circles a little white kid and a little black kid making friends on the first day of kindergarten. I mean, isn't that what we want this world to be like? Where we don't even see the boundaries, but we are just naturally attracted to one another and become friends. But unfortunately, we live in a very different world where race becomes a boundary for friendship and too often becomes a cause for mistreatment. And race is a huge boundary that is set up between people. You could add language as a boundary, culture as a boundary. This summer, we've opened up our campus to Lutheran Family Services refugee program to run their day camp for unaccompanied minors and refugees. I was heading home from work one day and I was parked just outside this door. And as I went to get in my car, there was, there was a little, little kid who had participated in the program kicking the soccer ball waiting to be picked up by his aunt. And I started passing the soccer ball with him. He didn't speak English, and I don't speak Spanish, uh, but we both spoke soccer. So we just yelled, go, all the time. I scored way more goals than he did. I'm pretty good at soccer. But I couldn't help but wonder about what his life will be like, how the language will be a barrier for him, how his immigration status will be a barrier for him. Will people cross the boundaries of race, of language, of culture, of immigration status to get to know this little boy, to help him thrive in our country? Race, language, culture, they're just some of the barriers that exist between us. And take a look at the barriers that Jesus crossed in our story for today. He comes in the middle of the day to a well and sits down there alone to rest while his disciples go find food. There's a woman who's coming to the well, and she's a Samaritan woman. Two barriers right away. She's a woman, barrier of gender, and she's a Samaritan, barrier of religion. And you could probably add race in there as well. Most Jewish men in Jesus' position wouldn't have even looked at her. 
let alone talk to her. They would have let those barriers prevent any personal connection or communication. Why? Because talking to her, well, it could be taken the wrong way. How often do we avoid connecting with people because we're afraid of what it might do to our reputation, what others might think? If Jesus talks to this woman, well, people might assume that he's hitting on her or hitting on another man's wife. It would threaten his reputation for being morally upstanding. If Jesus talks to this Samaritan, someone could accuse him of affirming false teaching. Don't you know the Samaritans have it all wrong about God? And you're talking to her? Are you saying that's okay? It would threaten his reputation for being a mainline teacher of the Orthodox faith. But Jesus crosses these boundaries intentionally. He's already intentionally come to Samaria, a foreign area. He crosses these boundaries and asks the woman for a drink of water. And she knows the boundaries exist. And she's taken aback by the whole thing. How is it that you, a Jew, ask me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink of water? Not only is Jesus crossing the boundaries, but he's asking to use her drinking vessel to drink from the same cup that she drinks from. Jesus is risking becoming unclean. But then as the conversation continues, more barriers become apparent. Because not only is this woman a woman from Samaria, but she's coming to the well in the middle of the day. Most of the people came together as a group. The women would come in the morning and draw water together before it got too hot. So it's likely that this woman is separated from her community for a reason. That they've rejected her. And then when Jesus asked her to go get her husband, and she says she has no husband, and he says, that's true, you've had five husbands, and the man you're with right now isn't your husband. Another barrier. This woman is morally suspect. I mean, what's she been doing? And who is Jesus talking to? But none of this phases Jesus. He crosses these boundaries, every single one of them, to offer her eternal life. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus does. And it's what he calls us to do as his followers. It's not easy, crossing boundaries. I remember I was in third grade, And we had a special guest uh, lecturer come and talk to our class. And it was a a gay man with HIV AIDS. And this was before we're just learning about the disease and and learning how it was passed and how it wasn't. And he was just telling us, you know, how how it's not passed, that we didn't need to be afraid of touching people. And, And I had just been baptized. I had just come to faith. I'd just become a Christian. I remember as he was talking and telling us all these things that I just felt this conviction. I need, to, I need to shake this man's hand. And so after class, I mustered up the courage. The bell rang. Everybody laughed as quickly as they could, and I went up to the man. And I remember he had his hands behind his back because he knew that people were uncomfortable touching him because they didn't know if they'd contract the disease or not. And I went up to him, and with all the courage a third grader can muster you know, stuck out my hand, and I didn't even know what to say, but he, uh, I remember he had tears in his eyes as he brought his hand from behind his back and shook my hand, and I just said, thank you for sharing with us today, and then I left. It wasn't easy for me to do that, and I think I was only able because I was young and naive and thought Jesus meant for us to do what he called us to do. The older I get, the harder it gets to cross those boundaries. Because I know all of the boundaries that exist, and I know the consequences to my own reputation of crossing them. It was easy in kindergarten. I didn't see the boundaries. It was challenging in third grade, but I was able to do it. But it's getting harder. Jesus calls us to overcome our discomfort, to risk our reputations, and to reach across boundaries and barriers to show his love. Jesus would be accused of partying with sinners, hanging out with prostitutes, 
and tax collectors. Can you imagine if me, your pastor, had a reputation for hanging out with prostitutes? How would that fly? Not so well, would it? That was Jesus' reputation. His reputation was so besmirched that he became an easy target for arrest and crucifixion. And I don't know when it happened that Christians got this idea that we should have a reputation for being moral and upstanding. That reputation probably means we aren't living out Jesus' call to cross the boundaries of race and gender and nationality and religion and sinfulness and class and ideology and all the things that separate us from one another. I mean, what do we have to do to get Jesus' reputation? Let's do that. I was talking with Floyd Preston, the director of Lutheran Fam Family Services Refugee and Asylum Program here in Colorado Springs. And he said that, you know, because they work with people from other countries on immigration issues, that they're often the target of a lot of anger and accusations. Even though they only deal with legal immigration, people still turn their backs on them and withhold donations because they don't want to be associated with anything about those people from other countries. But our church continues to support them, con continues to support refugees and unaccompanied minors seeking asylum in the United States. Why? Because Jesus calls us to cross boundaries. One story of that work that Jesus calls us to do was a young girl from Guatemala whose parents were so afraid for her life that they, they paid a coyote to take her into the United States. And the coyote began to take advantage of her and use her for sex. They got to the border of the United States and Lutheran Immigration Services got the girl separated from the coyote and found out what was going on, and separated her and saved her, helped her walk through the seeking asylum process. She was granted asylum, and then they connected her with Lutheran Family Services Rocky Mountains in Fort Collins, who helped her to find a foster family. Got her a foster family, and got her enrolled in high school here, here in Colorado, and just got word that she's not only graduated from uh, high school as a full ride scholarship to college because people followed Jesus, because Lutherans followed Jesus and crossed those boundaries and didn't let anything get in the way of doing what Jesus has called us to do, not even if it threatened our reputation. You are part of that work through your offerings. Every Sunday when we pass the plate and you give your tithes and offerings, some of it goes to this kind of work in the world, and so much more. You know, I was writing this sermon, I was like, I had this list of things that we do. It's like, that's just a self-congratulatory sermon. We're just patting ourselves on the back. But I'm going to do it anyway, because what you do is incredible. You serve at the Marion House Soup Kitchen on Fridays. You cross the boundaries of housing status, poverty, mental health, and much more. We're building homes for Habitat for Humanity and crossing income boundaries to help families afford a home. We're gonna be building a new home in August if you'd like to participate in that work. Contribute to Mosaic and cross the boundaries of ability, both physical and mental. I could go on and on talking about the quilts and the shawls and the blankets and the dolls, about family promise and Bible pharmacy and mission medical the Christian caregiving that some of you do to cross the boundaries of age and health, and of course the work we do with our synod and our national church to cross boundaries in the name of Jesus, to offer not only help but the good news of God's love in Christ. The school backpacks and supplies that you brought last week that are still piled up, although we've distributed many of them already, are living out the value of Jesus to cross boundaries and our high school students who went on the mission trip and went into the reservation to help was crossing the boundaries of nation and race and language. It was an easy list to make. It brings me great joy that there are so many easy examples to point to in how we are following the example of Jesus, but you and I both know that we have a long ways to go.
in following Jesus in this manner all the way. It's so easy to fall into complacency and only interact with people who look and act like us who are from our neighborhoods. So I want to challenge you today that you can practice crossing boundaries right here and now, here in your church, in your congregation. I've said it before that this, what we do here on Sunday is practice, practicing our discipleship because it's easy to practice here and then we can play out in the real world and live out our Christian faith. So today I want to challenge you to find somebody who is significantly younger or significantly older than you, but don't tell them that's why you picked them. <laughs> and just have a conversation, someone that you don't know. And I know we're all kind of nervous about that because you don't want to be the person that says, you know, I don't know you. And they're like, well, I've known you for 10 years. How do you not know me? Or say, hey, are you new here? And they're like, I'm on staff here. You know, we're worried about all of those things. It takes a bit of courage. We're afraid to talk to strangers, but here, of any place, we can practice. See what happens. Use me as your icebreaker. Say, Pastor Travis preached that I have to talk to someone new today, so you're it. Let's talk. See how it goes. See what happens. When Jesus did it, even to the chagrin of his disciples, not only was the Samaritan woman changed, but her whole community was changed. Because she went and told everyone about Jesus, and then they came too. And he ended up staying in that village, that foreign village, for two more days with all of his disciples too, showing them what it looks like to cross boundaries. And many people became believers in Jesus. Jesus crosses boundaries. We should copy that. Because we were on the other side of a barrier once that separated us from God. And Jesus hopped over it to come to us. Our sinful humanity is offensive to God, but he doesn't let it stop him from coming to where we are. He doesn't let anything about our situation prevent him from offering us salvation. He comes to where we are, wherever we are, and offers us full relationship with himself. And he paid the price to do it. He was misunderstood. He was hated. He was impugned by his own people. He was abandoned and tortured and killed, all for crossing the boundary between heaven and earth, between us and God. And he came to us, and he found us on our side of the fence. He doesn't beckon us to come to his side because he knows we're not able. He comes over to where we are takes our sin on himself. That is grace. Grace is God going over the barrier to where we are. He doesn't wait for us to clean up our act, to become better people, to stop our sinning. He starts the conversation just as he did with the Samaritan woman, and he will always take the initiative coming to us and to all people no matter where they are, and no matter what's in the way, nothing will stop him. He loves us that much. So we who have been reached by Jesus are now called to risk and sacrifice to reach others as we imitate Christ, to cross boundaries, and to offer the living water that is Christ himself. Copy that. Amen. Amen.